First, I would like to say that um, thank you to Parasite for inviting me to this conference. And I feel honored to be one speaker of many interesting thinkers and doers. Uh, I should also say that Cosmin and Qingying, they invited me to speak, or they wanted me to speak about the project that I was involved in in the Netherlands uh, um, from 2008 till still, kind of, uh, uh, which was a critique of a tradition called Svarte Piet, which caused a huge stir in the Netherlands. Uh, but I propose something else, <laughs> and I'm uh, kind of grateful for your generous, or that you so generously kind of accepted my proposal, and you don't really know what you got yourself into, but, uh, uh, and I was in, so I was invited to speak about intersection between art and politics, or well, that's the kind of topic, and, but I have to say that uh, I will neither talk about art, nor will I talk about politics, uh, but I will talk nearby. And hopefully I will talk through. Uh, but before I start the presentation, uh, I, or I rather say I always start my presentations with acknowledging the room that we are within. So, and I, therefore, I want you to look around in the room. I want you to look at the windows, the walls. I want you to look at the ceiling. I want you to look at the stage. I want you to look at how the stage is arranged and who is on stage. I want you to look at who is sitting around yourself. So you should turn around. You should greet the ones that look at you. You should look at who's, uh, who's in front of you, who's behind you, who is next to you. How are the seats arranged? What is the relationship between the chairs that you are sitting in and the stage? Also, you should look around yourself and see who is present in the room. What bodies are present? And at the same time as you think of the bodies that are present, you should also think of who is not present and which bodies are excluded from this space. I will now show you a few images. And I want you to think of what do you see and what do you hear?
In South Hall in London, there is a black feminist organization called South Hall Black Sisters, who since 1979 have been politically engaged in the struggle to improve social, political, and economic conditions for black and minority women in the UK. Ideologically, the organization refers to a socialist feminist tradition. But in contrast to the feminist second wave movement in the 1970s in the UK and in Europe, uh, that primarily talked about class and gender, South of Black Sisters uh, base their work on an intersectional analysis, that is, they consider both class, gender, and ethnicity. South of Black Sisters spent a lot of their time and resources to help individual black women to change their social situation. Most of the women who seek help suffer from domestic abuse and have an insecure immigration status. These two things are often related. For example, the women's possibility to stay in the country is dependent on a so-called spouse visa. This means that if they would like to leave their husband or wife, uh, they would have to, at the same time, they would be expelled from the country. So, that is, if they cannot prove, according to the law, that they are suffering from a domestic abuse. The work of SBS, that is South of uh, Black Sisters, uh, so short for South of Black Sisters, uh, can to some extent be compared with the work done by caseworkers in welfare offices. They receive women who need to get away from a violent situation, who are involved in child custody cases, who need to get a resident visa, and women who need to find somewhere to live. SBS, they also offer counseling services, English classes, and other activities that the women are in need of. In an interview with the director, Pragna Patel, uh, she told me that even though the work with the individual cases is very, very important, at the same time, it's a never-ending job. The cases will never stop coming as long as casework is not at the same time combined with political activities that aim at changing the very structures that have caused the oppression of these women. But in order for these political strategies to be relevant, they need to be anchored in the women's everyday needs. According to SPS, cha uh, changing structures is a daily battle. The political work does not only take place at special events, such as conferences like these, protest marches, impassionate political speeches, during trials, or in the political corridors. It takes place in the unspectacular everyday work. That is, when files are set up, when emergency calls are received, when solicitors are contacted, when cases are discussed and prepared, when English is being taught, when files are archived, receipts counted, notes taken, when the organization makes sure that the taxi picks up the abused woman at the correct address, when the surveillance camera is checked, when trips are organized, when emails are written, phone calls are answered, questions posed, when saying yes to an artistic film project, when documents are destroyed or saved, when the home page is updated, uh, when there is an audit, when considering an invitation, when chatting with a client, when photographs are put on the walls, or when meetings are held, or when doors are being closed. SBS, they use as an old domestic house as their offices. From April 2010 till September 2010, um, no longer than that, sorry. <laughs> yeah, from April 2010 till kind of December 2010, I visited SPS on a weekly basis. When I sat there in their offices and observed their work, I was reminded of Jean Dielman in Chantal Ackerman's film, Jean Dielman, 23 Quai du Commerce, 1080 Brussels. Could we please play the video? In Jean Dielman, we get to follow a housewife 
and her household work. She peels the potatoes, she cleans the house, runs errands, and helps her son with his homework. Can we have a little bit of sound in the background just? The film is constructed around three days in Jean Dielman's life. The scenes are filmed with a static camera. The woman walks in and out of the image in order to do her work. In the middle of her work, the doorbell rings. A man enters the apartment. She takes his coat and hat. Together they go into the bedroom. The camera stays outside. After a while, they come out again. They do not speak to each other. John gives the man his coat. He takes out his wallet and gives her some money. Then he says, till next week. As a viewer, I don't know what took place in the bedroom. Jeanne goes to the sitting room. She puts the money into a jar of porcelain on the table. She goes to the bedroom where she removes a towel that is placed on a neatly made bed and she opens the window. She goes to the bathroom to wash herself. After that, she goes back to the kitchen and continues her work. She conducts all her work calmly and methodically. She turns off the lights as soon as she leaves the room. She folds her clothes carefully and neatly. She puts objects into straight lines. It seems like nothing moves John. All her movements have the same pace and no emotions are shown. Even the interaction with her teenage son seems to be a routine matter. When they speak to each other, it, of, it sounds monotonous and distant as if they are reading a text to each other. The next day, another man rings the doorbell. The man and John go to the bedroom, and also this time the camera stays outside. But in the following scene, a shift has taken place in her movements. When the man leaves, she forgets to put the lid back on the jar where she keeps the money. Her otherwise so neatly uh, done hair is messy. The potatoes are overcooked, and she has to run to the shop to buy more. When her son comes home, she does not greet him by the door. He comments on her messy hair, which he, like me, as a viewer, is not used to. When they sit in the sitting room after dinner, it's him that has to remind her of their daily evening walk. Something has disturbed her routine and rhythm but she still seems very indifferent and distant. The third day begins as the other days. Jean polishes her son's shoes and wakes him up before breakfast is ready. But something has changed. The other days, her movement had been so exact, but now she drops things. She stops in the middle of a movement, and she sits on a chair for a long time without doing anything. Also this day, there is a man that comes to her flat. But this time, the camera follows them into the bedroom. We get to see how Jean takes her clothes off and the man has sex with her. He lies heavy upon her. At one point, it looks like she wants to get up. Or does she have an orgasm? It's hard to tell, since uh, uh, it's hard to read her expressions. The man does not pay attention to her. It's actually even hard to tell whether he has sex with her. The act seems to be yet another everyday duty. After the intercourse, Jean gets dressed. No words are uttered. The man is still on the bed. He stretches out. There is a something in the way he takes up space in the room that seems to disturb John. Suddenly, she grabs the scissors on the bedside table and stabs him. He dies. John goes into the dark sitting room, and for a few minutes, we watch John at the table. This is the last scene of the film. For me, the film asks questions about women's paid and unpaid labor, about women's role in the home and how she's used and abused. 
Jean is a character that first sight does not seem to do anything but work. She takes care of the home, she helps her neighbor, looks after her almost adult son, and offers male client sexual services. But Jean does not seem to have any space for her own desires. Her life is governed by duties and routines. Even though no one forces her, everyone expects her to be there for them. Nobody asks her what she wants to do or is able to do. The sun reminds her when she departs from her normal routines, and the film acknowledges gender-related oppression that takes place silently. Can expectations be oppressive? Can you participate in your own oppression? But what is especially interesting with Jean Dielman is that the film does not only acknowledge oppression, it also acknowledges household work as a form of knowledge. It shifts between, I shift between upset by the oppressive structures that her actions are a part of and finding pleasure in the fact that household work is presented as a result of acquired knowledge. There is a scene where John, in real time, prepares mince. She seems to have done this many times. She knows exactly how much flour, egg, and breadcrumbs she has to use. She knows exactly how long she needs to work the mince. Her exact movements are a result of experience and practice. The work has a meditative quality. Jean seems to have a lot of knowledge about food, a knowledge that is not acknowledged if you're a housewife, but certainly if you're paid as a chef. In 1975, Ackerman stressed the work that is done by the housewife by letting the viewer follow the whole preparation process. The scene does not end till the work is done, and in the scene with the mince, it strikes me that maybe Jean is not indifferent and distant after all. Rather, she knows her work so well that she can let her thoughts wander off. What does Jean think of when she works? Is this a time and place where she can attend to her own desires and fantasies? When the film ends with Jean sitting quietly at the table in a dark sitting room, the question lingers. What will happen now? Where will she go? What will happen to her son? What will Jean's tomorrow look like? You can go back to the images. So for black sisters, they work with women who have experienced physical and psychological violence. They have not only been beaten and sexually abused, but also been used as household slaves. And they are very often very limited in how they can move outside the home. The former domestic house where SBS has its offices is a place for resistance against this. But also here, household duties need to be taken care of. The rooms need to be cleaned, lunch need cooked, and plates washed. But the house where the activities take place 
is no longer a home. It's an office belonging to a political organization in a space with domestic architectural elements. When I sat there in their offices and observed the different activities that took place, I started to read politics and resistance into every gesture. By saying that, I do not imply that every action or every word that it was uttered had the political content, but rather that it's the framework that politicizes the gestures. The daily work of SBS is also the foundation for the more public presentation that they do, or to say it differently, it's within the public events, like political meetings, conferences, campaigns and demonstrations, that the thoughts and conclusions drawn in daily work are shared with other political activi activists. South for Black Sisters has documented several of these public presentations uh, with photographs, video, and sound. When I worked with South for Black Sisters, I looked in, into a lot of their material and I also um, was present at one public presentation. And during the public presentation, Pragna Mattel made a speech, a very passionate speech, where she talked about the, um, the work that SBS does. And in a 10 minute long speech, she managed to, uh, in a very uh, uh, kind of, sum, like a, she summarized the history of the organization. And she talks about uh, the resistance of black women about the importance to continue the political feminist struggle, and she compared today's society with the society that existed in the early 80s. Patel also uh, connected the work of the organization to other social movements and discourses by using well-known concepts and references. In that way, she did not only talk about the history of the organization, but also uh, associated with other struggles and other po historical processes. And at the same time as she spoke, the, the members of SBS were behind her and by their giving, uh, supporting her in her arguments. Daily work, of course, differs from the, the public presentation. In the everyday, it's rather the action than the words that matter. The action can be expressed in word, but this is not about informing or creating a story, but to resist and change. Even though daily work is slow and misses the dramatic qualities that can be found in public speeches, it does not mean that it's done without passion. But it has a different form and a different aim. If the purpose of the speech is to relate to other political movements and events through words, daily work is legitimized by the changes that are made. But it's that intimate relationship between the individual and collective, the practical and theoretical, the everyday life and the public events, the immediate and the imaginary, that has a potential of shifting politics. The women who seek help from SBS, they suffer abuse that take place behind closed doors, that in a sphere that is called home. The violence is structured so that no one outside the house will notice it, or at least will not be able to change it. But it governs her whole life, what she can do, what she can say, how she can relate to the world outside the home, and it affects her body and thoughts. The violence is a point of departure for the organization, but the women who come to SBS are not individual victims of violent uh, men. The, their situation have, of course, structural causes. Therefore, the women who come to SBS are also actors in a political process that aims for change, and this is actually very, very important. So just by, going to, by being part of SBS, that that is an action, a political action in itself. So the work at SBS should, should not be only regarded as a form of resistance. At the same time, the work, the work aims for a society that is not yet there. It, po it points to an alternative society 
without female oppression. The work is, in other words, an action that po points uh, towards both what is, what is and what can become. So this is important. It both affirms something that is, and it also aims for something that is not yet there. Um, it aims for a new existence, but departs from the existing. Or to be even more concrete, the alternative is not within the formal aspects of their work, but in your imagination. So the question is, what did you see and what did you hear? I get out of the tube at Tensta, which is a suburb to Stockholm in Sweden. Outside the tube station, there is a big group of men and some women. Several of them carry placards and banners. They are on their way into the tube. I never see the text on the placards and banners. I turn right. It takes me approximately five minutes to walk to the women's center, which is housed in a basement in a residential area. When I enter the basement apartment where Tiensta Women's Center is housed, I can choose whether I want to take off my shoes or whether I want to put some blue plastic bags over them. I choose to take them off. I look to the left, into the kitchen. I see women who prepare food. One woman mixes dough, another woman rolls it out, and a third woman cooks it on a grill. I never enter the kitchen. There is an intimacy and concentration and intensity in their movements that I neither want to nor can interrupt. I continue through the corridor into the big room. It looks like a former sitting room, but still not. The windows are far too small for that. Several tables form a big circle. There are old bookshelves in the room, filled with all kinds of things, books, plastic flowers, pen, folders, flags, cards. And along the walls, I see letters from the alphabet and pictures from different events. At one end of the room, there's a big whiteboard. Swedish class is about to begin. A few women have arrived. They seem to be around 50 to 60 years old. Some wear the hijab. Another woman has just uh, dyed her hair dark brown, but she missed some gray patches. Ruken, the teacher, she enters the room. Referring to the film The Dictator, she innates, initiates a discussion on the relation between dictatorships and democracies. A woman who is a refugee from Iraq and Saddam Hussein's regime says that she has started to long for the time before Saddam Hussein was overthrown. In the middle of the discussion, more women enter the room. One woman has started to cry. The women acknowledge the woman crying, but continue the discussion. They seem to be used to her tears. Another woman tells us that the financial crisis in Romania forced her to retire early, leave her apartment in Bucharest, and lacking other alternatives, she moved to a man in Sweden. A man that she's in love with, but she just hoped that the relationship will last. Or rather, there is no other alternative. Over the next few months, I visit the center on a regular basis. Similar scenes are played out. Often women cook together in the kitchen. After a few weeks, I am invited into the kitchen. I enjoy watching the bodily movements. They are so exact. Like in Jean Dielman, 
I can see that there are many years of experience behind those movements. At the same time as they cook, the women speak to each other. They talk about everyday life, about violence, about longing, about frustrations, about recipes, about education, about encounters with authorities, and about the upcoming wedding party. <laughs> Ten minutes. Uh, I'm towards the end. <laughs> In the other room, uh, different classes take place. From my perspective, I would describe them more as mutual conversations when everyday life experiences are shared than a language course in the traditional sense. Women speak about the Swedish how the Swedish authorities are intervening in their lives, how civil servants do not trust them when they inform them that they are sick, how they are forced to look for non-existing jobs in order not to lose their benefits. I hear stories about how women are treated as children by civil servants and local politicians, I hear stories about how their daughters and sons are stopped and checked by the police in the tube in Stockholm just because they have dark skin. Several women tell similar stories and they discuss what strategies they can use to get the authorities, doctors and landlords to listen to them. At the center, I hear stories about class travels from middle class to working class. I hear stories about the contemporary Sweden where ethnicity, class, and gender matters. Sometimes the discussions at the center are very heated, and other times they quickly share experiences and then go back to study Swedish grammar. Sometimes, uh, or in other words, when visiting the center, I hear women of different backgrounds, classes, and ethnicities, and age gather, not primarily to criticize an existing system, but to form an everyday community and to develop strategies in order to shift politics. A community in which cooking together is an important act. In the kitchen, I often see a woman sitting on a chair silently. She never talks, but she sits there, but she just sits there, but at the same time, she's an active participant. In other rooms, I hear women who write protest letters and discuss political actions. Like with Southwell Black Sisters, I see this as a place where resistance can be uh, built, uh, but also alternative formed in the actual doing. And I want to stress this doing, because it's the, the presence of the women in the space that has the potential of proposing alternative communities. But I also see something else. I see a municipal, like a local authority, that forces a center to register the women who visit them and who demand a progress report for every woman who is enrolled in a class. A local authority that measures and evaluates uh, women who, and who wants this to be a place to, to, that prepares women for non-existing jobs. But the organization is not a job center. It's a place for everyday politics. It's a community for those things that cannot be measured that easily, at least. The value is not in what the women produce. It is in their bodily presence. And within this uh, situation, the, the women's center is trying to find methods to survive as an organization. They organize Swedish classes but it's actually not the, the, the teaching or the education that is the primary thing. Rather, they use governmental and local uh, munis municipal uh, directions and policies in order to do something else, in order to create a political, everyday community where cooking is not an unpolitical act. Thank you. I don't know what you have with you, but I would love to see some of your work. Yeah. Um, I think what you've opened up for us is um, a way, and I feel slightly cheated in, in that I haven't seen how some of this sort of manifests itself. And, and, and I don't know if you're going to have time uh, to share with, with a bigger group, but then 
perhaps after sort of seeing uh, a bit, one of the questions I'd love uh, to open up and, and, uh, and ask for your uh, consideration is how, because you've shared with us something very intimate, um, and what I'd love to understand is how through your film you, you're able to yeah. extend that intimacy and to which audience. And, uh, yeah. So the, the, this is actually a title of, a, of a, a film I made together with Southwell Black Sisters, uh, which is called The Sisters, and the, where the film focuses on, on uh, uh, daily work as a form of uh, resistance, but through their activities. But I have this uh, principle that I never talk about my works. <laughs> I'm happy to show them, and I'm happy to give uh, links to the films. And, uh, but I, uh, in conferences like this, I always try to talk through the research. So in a way, uh, what I've done is, is uh, revealed some kind of research, but which also uh, departs from a, quite a big historical research I've made into British film collectors of the 70s, where I looked into the different uh, aesthetic strategies that were used by the film collectors in order to make politics. So it's actually, I'm, but I'm using this performative method in order to address those, actually, those uh, questions, but in a very different manner. Um, but which I'm also would be happy to talk about, but it's, as I said, I'm really avoiding to talk about uh, um, uh, both the historical research as well as the, about the works. Uh, um, but I'm very, very happy to give you links and also to, um, it would have, for example, been possible for me to do a show a film and then do a Q&A, but I never, I never present my own works. But, but in this manner, I do them. Yeah. But the second question was around uh, intimacy, uh, yeah. around how, you, how the work creates that. Because what you've done uh, here is, and, and maybe we can just pick this up in the plenary later, but I, I'd love to understand how the film then yeah. works uh, and to, for which audience. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the audience is, uh, it has a, that's actually a very important question, like who, who'd, uh, who the films address. Uh, and uh, I think, for example, when I work with Suffer Black Sisters, we address actually a, a kind of wide audience because the films both address a pol a, like, a political, like a political activist, a political audience, but as well as they are circulated within the... the um, for me, they are also artworks. Uh, they are not necessary. They are... They kind of use a documentary strategy, but they are not necessarily documentaries. Um, but rather within the images itself, I, 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 with it, I try to propose something with the images. So the image actually becomes extremely crucial in making politics. So I, I thought that um, just um, Anthony Young, just before me, he talked about whether it's about uh, having the, whether you, the, the art should be seen as a tool uh, to make uh, for politics or whether, uh, what was the other you said? Um, or if it's a concept, art for art's sake. I, I wouldn't say it's that simple as that at all, actually. I would say that to use aesthetics is politics. So it has a, um, um, that the images actually propose something, um, which of course is also something that comes out of a, like a, um, in the 70s when, when a lot of feminist theorists proposed sig the signification as a method instead of representation. But I think it doesn't make sense anymore to talk about signification, but rather to talk about maybe proposals or, or have a different kind of a approach to it. But at least it comes out of that. Petra, um, we were talking about ethics of listening. I'm, I'm formulating my thoughts, but mm -hmm. I just want to say how um, I, I think it's important to me when you showed the images that the voices of the women were not there but very much present. Yeah. Um, and I thank you for presenting that in a very sort of careful kind yeah. of way and I would love to talk to you more about that. Yeah. But this is actually, this is uh, uh, actually very, I think that's a very important comment. It's very uh, also in the film itself uh, is it's you never... Uh, it's, it's been very carefully thought who is, who is heard at, one, at what point. Uh, and, uh, and the film is never... Um, the film is really about work, but not about abused women, for example. <laughs> because I, I, they are not abused in the, When they are at the SBS, they are not abused. So, 
So I think that's very, that's also why, exactly why I didn't uh, want to talk to the images. I talked to John Dielman, so I'm a, yeah, but <laughs> not to the other <laughs> images. Yeah. Thank you, Petra, very much.